Well, welcome, and uh, you're looking at a YouTube video for the Science 114 lab book for Norwalk Community College's Science 114, which is the Physics, Chemistry, Biology class. Um, and I am going to help you or help introduce to you how and why you should be thinking about the lab book the way you think about it. In class, I've already told you that there are three examples of Science 114 lab books over inside the library. So you can go to the reserve desk, you can check them out for a minute, see who's good, see who's bad, um, and then make the determination of what actually works for you. And what that usually means is students come back and they say, oh look, I already know what a lab book is for. Let's adjust the screen here a little bit for you. Okay, I know what a lab book is for. I've seen that I should have a title, a hypothesis, some methods, maybe some materials, and I'll record my observations and the results as well as the conclusions. And that might be useful for the classes you've taken in the past. Um, yeah, if the instructor is just going down a checklist and going, oh, okay, I see a title, I see a hypothesis, and uh, yeah, I got all this other stuff here, so yeah, they get a grade. Um, this class isn't interested in that. It is interested in making sure you use all of these, don't get me wrong, that's sort of like, this is your grade school level. And now what we want to make sure you're doing is if you're thinking about what a lab book is used for, do you understand that all of these tools are helping you to communicate with somebody else? And every time I say this, people roll their eyes. Somebody should be able to repeat your experiment and get generally the same observations and the same results that you got. They're not going to be identical. In fact, they may draw different conclusions from the same set of data that you get, okay? But if you get the same observations and you get the same results, it means at least your methods and the materials that you used were correct. And what it means is this is actually how you learn if what your hypothesis was was correct to begin with, and if you're communicating properly, if the hypothesis was correct, that you did understand what you're actually doing. There are innumerable published peer-reviewed articles out there that take the same set of data and they try to derive the same conclusions. And depending upon, uh, imagine a school of thought would be, say, inside economics. If you have behavioralists versus quants, you're going to get completely different conclusions. But what isn't different are the methods that were used, the materials that were used, the observations that were recorded, and or all of the results that were recorded. Okay. What if you think of it like this? Instead of the previous way you've thought about labs, think about it as a summary, which is an abstract that condenses all of that information. If you go look at those library books, you'll see that two of them actually have, let's see what I can put inside here. Uh, let's go like this. Two of the three actually have some form of a summary at the beginning. Right? And that summary tells you at least attempts to tell you what the question was, how they went about answering it. Did their data actually make sense? Data collected, D-A-T-A, -A, collected, and did it make sense? Okay, if you can keep it that simple, you know you're actually on the right track. Now the question should be, this is how we know, this is how this lab understands if you're thinking or not. If you're looking at data and you're going, oh, I don't know if it makes sense or not, that means you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, which is why you want to think about labs the way you're thinking about them. I'll, give, I'll walk you through an example in a few minutes, but at the end of the day, regardless of the experiment you're doing, let's imagine you're learning how to invest money, right? So you're going to take some set of money, put X number of dollars here, and you're going to collect the data. Your dollars went up. Okay, yay, fantastic, and as a result of this, you have some sort of sense that whatever you were doing was actually working. And now imagine you're going to look at this over time, okay, and you say, oh, okay, that actually makes sense. So now I can state that if I take this amount of material, capital, and then I do these sets of manipulations, my method, 
and that method is going to give you some sort of result, and that result is your data. Now you can explain it to somebody such that it makes sense, okay? People tend to understand money better than they do experiments, which is why we're using money here. Okay, now imagine, if you will, hey, you started losing money. What modifications might you make? And then what are the observations of any of those modifications? So this might be your first month or so of playing around with your money, okay? But the market crashes, you then have to figure out something to do, and then you actually record those modifications you've done. Maybe you took your money out of a high yield savings account and you put it into just a safe savings account where you're not losing any money, something along those lines, okay? Or high yield interest bearing stock portfolio, which is now going into a safe high yield interest bearing savings account. All of these small differences change the data that you will collect. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the last part that people seem to ignore is that you should tell us all of the materials used, right down to who made the tools, right, as best you can, what you actually observed while you were doing it, and then what actually happened that was unexpected or expected. Notice unexpected there, okay, because you're, there will be some people who will be like, oh, let's just ignore that. You can't ignore the data that you collect. That's just lying, okay? So. erase all of that. Let's go here. So what should my lab book look like? Well, again, let's sort of adjust all of this so it sort of makes sense for you. Let's go like that. No, I'm going to have to apply. Let's go like this a little bit. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure it all fits for you. So what should my lab book look like? Well, that's up to you. What works for you, but somebody could literally follow to do what? I mean, obviously, they're going to follow what you did so they can replicate what you did. Replicate. Within your own experiments, you'll be doing replications, right? You'll be doing multiples. You'll do multiple ends, okay? But that's within your experiment. What happens if somebody picks up your lab book and they do that same number of replicates? They should get the same data. What the class actually requires of you, okay? There should be a table of contents. Should be some summary or an abstract at the beginning of each of the each total lab effort, right? So, if <sighs> helicopter drop is a two-week lab effort, maybe you package all that stuff together so that all of the data and any supporting materials is with that. And what I want you to do is think of each lab as a subfolder to the main folder that is your lab book. Okay. Note. Some people have already started missing labs, which is kind of weird, but if you were not here for a particular lab, your lab notebook should reflect that. Now, what that means is maybe you're working with the, the rest of your group and you guys are collecting data and sharing data, but you should put the correct attribution, attribution to who did the effort. If it wasn't you. I don't want to, I don't want to walk away from your lab book thinking that you're the person who actually did it. Okay. Good. So let's go in through an example here. Let's make this. Okay. So you made a paper thing, right? Your textbook wants you to think about it as a, as a helicopter. Great. You will have, or you have dropped it X number of times. I think inside this lab, I asked for five. Every semester, these labs change to make sure people just can't copy each other's previous lab books. Okay. And if what, remember, if you've done this and you've collected your data for the lab, you should, you shouldn't be just going, well, I'm just dropping this thing compared to something else. Who the frick cares about that? Why did you do it? Okay. Why did you actually design this helicopter? What does it represent in the natural world? Okay, why would we actually take time out of your precious lives to have you do some work? Okay, that should be part of your summary and your abstract. You know, obviously, you're going to find some of this discussion inside of your textbook, inside chapter two, I think it is, right? When we're looking at free fall versus vertical and horizontal forces, right? Now, in the execution piece of your lab, did you actually make any mistakes? And if so, how did you account for them? And did you explain it? And if you explained it, I should be able to find something like that inside your data, okay, as well as the analysis of your data, 
And this is like one of those things that's sort of no different than us going back to thinking about, you know, investments. If you put very little thought and time into your investments, you're going to have very little to show for it. The same thing with all of these labs. They're not terrifically difficult labs. There are multiple steps where lots of mistakes could happen along the way. That's what you're supposed to be experiencing. And if you don't put the effort into it, you're not going to get anything out of it, if that makes any sense. And this is like one of those preachy moments. So ignore it if you want to. But at the end of the day, remember, I've already given you the matrix, X, you know, that is going to be used to actually score your effort. And if you look at your lab and you compare it and it says, oh, look, barely did a goddamn thing. Well, you know, you're going to get a zero or a one on that. And that's not what you want to be doing. Okay. Enough for now. I'm going to load this stuff up onto YouTube and send you guys the link. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Bye.